So welcome everybody, uh, and this is Brian and Chris here. Um, we're talking about New World and giving my first impressions of uh, the PTR's Brimstone Sands. Um, but this is also a conversation, especially about PTR, about leaks and data mines. Uh, if you guys haven't been following my New World content, I have a channel that's focused just on New World. It's called Ginger World Gaming. And honestly, it is just obviously right now with the hype and with everything coming to the game itself, it is just blowing up. So thank you guys already over 5,000 subscribers on the new world channel alone. And it's an exciting time to be a new world fan. And overall, they just added the PTR, the new zone brimstone sands, which is a massive desert Egyptian and Roman themed environment. One of the things that I really actually enjoy about new world is it's taking from all of human history and bringing in some of these iconic people who have made their way to this island. And it's just an interesting way to kind of tell these unique tales. But uh, on the PTR, we've also seen data mining. And if you guys have seen any of our Final Fantasy 14 content, our data mine, anytime data mining comes in, it's always a red alert flag being like warning, warning, because we've seen time and time again, things that come up in data mines that have a different take on what people's expectation lines up. And we've seen that happen with mounts, especially in Final Fantasy 14. So ultimately, Chris has yet to kind of see what's going on. I keep him apprised in these videos uh, of what's going on with New World. Uh, he plays, he's got like your characters are in, in level 30 range, etc. Brimstones is a, is a level 60 zone that's being added. But the beauty of this also is it's not just the Brimstone Sands zone. They're going back through uh, the other starting zones and really kind of like it feels to me like they're having this level of confidence of, hey, we've learned a lot of lessons. How can we how would we revisit the game itself? So I've played the new player experience. I've played and explored the, the new zone. And there's this massive giant worm boss that just is like you're running around and all of a sudden it's like. And there's this thing that's just going to try and eat you. It's pretty surreal. Like, it's pretty epic. And so I want to kind of, like, answer any questions that Chris has about the zone itself. And we're going to also then talk about, like, PTR and data mining and leaks. Because we saw Gr uh, Grand Theft Auto 6 kind of get leaked and some of the conversation around that. So, Chris, floor is yours. So I, I think there's two things at play here as somebody that plays many MMOs. And with any of you guys here that usually focus on um final fantasy 14 but like i i also play wow i also play guild wars 2 um so i guess first we'll talk about the content that's coming and then we'll talk about how they are unveiling it because final fantasy 14 does not do any form of ptr mm -hmm. and heavily avoids spoilers world of warcraft goes far the other direction yet still from time to time you see data mining and spoilers um some communities choose to give literally no information on anything at all as we've watched um grand theft auto six leaks this week and and new world seems to be somewhere in between so gameplay first um when you talk about the zone being level 60 that's one of the hard things about adding content mm -hmm. is you continue to add content this kind of acts as their you know as they're trying to get their feet on what will an expansion look like what does a patch look like this seems solely in-game focused mm -hmm. does this drive the population to spending most of their time in that zone that would be, I think, unfortunate for the game as a whole. It will drive, I think, for a little bit, but then as things get settled down, you might like that zone and its aesthetic more than you like the other end game zones. But the nice thing about it, the strength in that, is that it is visually different from like that of Ebenskill Reach or Reek Water, so that or you know Shattered Mountain. So it's it's a whole new biome, so that from a visual aesthetic. It's not like, oh, this was just copy and paste, like trying to move me over here. But for the least the short term, the way that they've got it designed in the content and how everything's kind of laid out, I think it's going to be very popular with endgame players for at least a month or two before populate. You end up kind of saying like, yeah, I'm kind of sick of being in the desert. I'm going to go back to where the trees are wild and crazy and and what have you. Um, what that's going to be really an interesting take because we already see in the map itself too, Chris, is that there's more zones that are already attached to this in the west and in the north and then the question is is that does that continue to scale up in terms of level or do we start to see them also offering like you said like a mid core or a lower level zone that could end up having some value to the player base in, in the long run um the nice thing though is that they like it, while, instead of adding in new zones like if you go look at you know monarch's bluff it's got a very king arthur theme now castles 
when you go look at like uh you know um you know everfall like it has this very like european kind of feel with its design and layout and they're saying they've got big plans for first light so that it looks like it, at least in the meantime outside of adding in a new lower level zone or a new mid-level zone they're going back and saying hey we've learned a lot in the last year let let's take that knowledge and actually bring it into the the entire game so that anybody coming back is kind of be surprised there's going to be a reason to play in the lower level zones okay so i think that's positive right they're not leaving content to die um one of the things that i see really struggle with games that suffer from long-term success uh games that make the mistake of living a long time uh guild wars 2 world of warcraft and final fantasy all do this and so when you look at games that survive a really long time that problem with long-term life is that legacy content eventually becomes too old to support and just dies. Mm -hmm. You see this with, you know, many people that don't enjoy um, aspects of the realm reborn zones. You see this with uh, world of Warcraft with basically anything that's not its current expansion. Um, and Guild Wars has various forms of content that do die, even as a lateral game. Um, it's dungeons, for example, uh, are pretty under supported. So it's nice to see them taking the initial steps to continue to support content. It would be a bad sign if a year in they were like, yeah, there's already some things we consider old, not old yet. Uh, and so it's nice to see them supporting that. Do we have any idea like how often they're going to release zones like this? Or do we get a full expansion at some point? Or is it always just steady one zone, one zone, one zone? That's one of the things when it comes down to the unknown with New World, because people are labeling this as an expansion and that's something i've been trying to kind of fight that mindset this is just an update a big update as a part of the roadmap and it does expand the zone so i can see how people make that kind of connection but i do think we're going to hear about bigger announcements that might adhere to that of an expansion itself because if this was like people will say in terms of scope or size you would think of this as a dlc over like the term expansion where destiny kind of really screwed that you know kind of refining thing back in the original days at least they now seem to have their ducks in a row when it comes down to that so this feels more akin to a dlc than uh than a real expansion and um but we don't know we don't know if they're going to go the the you know the um uh, the no man's sky route or we don't know if they're going to go the paid expansion route i do get the the feeling we'll see paid expansion you know model come into the game um and this you know. is free right this is free yeah this is yeah so it starts to feel like i know you're not caught up in guild wars but in guild wars this starts to feel like a living season so living seasons add to the narrative narrative element of this of the game they add new high-end battle content they add a new zone specifically targeting those players but they do so in a way that ideally continues to foster more new players come into the game that don't yet have access to that zone and more and the the veteran players to have more reasons to go back into old zones so like living seasons tend to just expound on the game and i think that's that's a good thing um so it sounds really close to that method uh wow does this with patches where they'll add a new zone but then that new zone is usually wildly gimmicky so it's usually really focused on a particular narrative a particular way of interacting with that zone and so it actually feels um closer to like a bosja zadnor but without the timer it feels like this big ongoing zone that you're supposed to go visit and if you miss that patch you actually might skip that zone altogether as opposed to like when i go into guild wars i'm still going back into old living season zones and i need to for various things um but in wow like if you if you join in dragonflight you're not going to go back and do Zareth Mortis, I guess. Like you just, you just don't. Um, you don't go back and do Nash Dazar or whatever it was called in BFA. You just, you just ignore these zones. Um, but I think be, part of that's because they don't leverage legacy stuff. So how, when, so Final Fantasy doesn't do this. Right. Final Fantasy has added exploratory zones, but they're instances effectively. So we've never really gone in and had like whole oh. zones added. We have had like right. the tribal quests of Thavnir actually created a location that did not exist during MSQ. And that that zone itself in Thavnir changed a lot over MSQ. Um, but they've never gone in and been like, and now you get to go to Northern Vilebrand, or now you get to go yeah. to the other half of Thavnir, or now you get to go to Corvos. We don't do that mid expansion. We get a, a we get a, a palette of zones yeah. at the beginning of the expansion, we build on those. Will this zone be something they continue to develop will the zone be kind of full featured from day one um what does it look like when new world decides to add a zone 
Uh, that's going to be when when it fully drops in live, uh, you know, in October. I think we're going to have a better understanding, but it does feel very fully featured. It does come with a dungeon. It does come with open world dungeons uh, and places of interest that you want to go explore and, you know, various different. Like it also what, what's interesting also is it comes with new materials so that from recipes and crafting recipes, how does this affect the world economy now that we can get sandstone, now that we can get you know, like uh, this other thing. It also comes with, what's just really interesting. When we start talking about um, some of the negative things that happen to you as a player in the game, we've had, you know, blight, which is like this poison. Uh, we've had corruption, which, you know, will put damage on you. Uh, and brimstone, it introduces acid as a, you know, another thing that can hurt you. And then if you're, you know, like they can impact you as your as a player. So it's like, how, how is that also going to overall impact the economy? Because there are recipes that, you know, new recipes obviously coming in that will take advantage of these materials, but older recipes don't have those, those materials factored in. So is this going to be something that obviously high end players, you know, for just high end play is going to kind of impact it. We also get the ultimate abilities that kind of change out how your builds are going, going to function maybe uh, in the long run. And this is one of the weird and interesting things and where I kind of want to take this uh, conversation to, but uh, before we do uh, kind of talk about PTRs, the positive and the negatives, because we know 14 does not, but then we do know WoW does and, you know, New World does. Um, yeah, Agent in uh, chat says a Dune-based RPG would actually be cool. They're actually making a Dune MMORPG that was announced, uh, you know, and that's something that's going to be coming on the way. But also when it comes to, like, yeah, you think Dune, there's Stargates in, in Brimstone. Like, there are these, like, structures either built by the Ancients and then that started me when I looked at it, I go, that looks kind of like what I would call a Stargate. And you don't want to know who owns the Stargate IP? Amazon, because <laughs> they bought MGM. And they, they are now the, the whole. And I was like, how, what a weird twist of a world would it be if in our non-licensed, you know, based off any license or franchise MMO, we start bringing in our, you know, like our licenses and our franchises. But it's pretty, it was just interesting. It was just interesting. It to does kind mean of you see. can never sell those if you start making those events or, yeah. or, or, and when you do, it gets more complex. Like if you've been mixing everything, mm. it's why Square Enix even keeps that stuff separate, right? You see like even crossovers within the Square Enix company feel like they're licensing it from themselves. Yeah. Um, Cause they're keeping those properties separate. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So now here we are on the PTR. So uh, okay. over on the PTR, actually even uh, Damone Kim, another content creator covers MMOs as well. Uh, he was breaking down like some of the data mines and things that we're seeing. We know loadouts are coming. We know mounts are coming to this game. We know like all of these things are coming and we know that they're going to have fresh start servers. And then we talked about last week, the impact, the pros and cons. We know there's going to be a kind of a Twitch uh, event, lots of streamers race for new world again, all over and over. Uh, and so there's like all this stuff we, we actually found from data mining from the PTR itself. So it looks like a lot of these things are going to be pretty uh, integrated and exciting for the game's future. But how much of that being that, like, even in my video talking about Brimstone, I actually just open up with like a, just a regular, like kind of coffee chat kind of, uh, you know, face before I'm like the rest of this video, I'm going to be showing the zone. So if you do not want it spoiled, like, you know, visually for you don't, you know, like just note that minimize this. If you still want to hear my thoughts, etc. like that in and of itself is like, how much does PTRs have a negative or a positive impact on MMORPGs, especially because this is really my first foray into a PTR where in the past you said, if you really want to get the jump on and covering world of Warcraft, especially as a YouTuber, you have to be on their PTR. I have to be on the PTR and yeah. I don't like being on the PTR. Why don't you like being on PTR? I don't, I don't like what a PTR. So I like the way Final Fantasy does things. They give us two live letters. They've shown us some dungeon screenshots. They've shown us what to expect. It's more than enough from a coverage standpoint to cover as the news and be educated on it. And when patch day comes, I'm experiencing things for the first time. But if somebody pops in and say, hey, what changed today? I can give them a rundown. It's more than enough to do my job. It's more than enough for me to enjoy it as a player, mm -hmm. um, but it does not venture into the territory of trying to actively kind of have my day one experience early on World of Warcraft. If you are somebody that likes to be on the cutting edge economically in the game, um, world first race, uh, a content creator, or you're just somebody that likes to be on the cutting edge of what's out there and you like, like leaks and things like that, a PTR becomes an official form of them leaking things on there in trade for hopefully getting back some feedback. So mm -hmm. I like that people do engage with the PTR. I'm just not going to be one of them. Yeah. Like I like that they're there because they're asking for feedback. So I hope somebody gives it to them. I'm just telling you it's not going to be me um, historically. 
And, and so like my views on that are kind of slowly changing as I like to be a little more aware of what more games are doing. And a PTO is a really good way to kind of see their thought process mm -hmm. because you're getting to see them think kind of in real time. Um, but 14 doesn't do a PTR. Guild Wars does anything they want a PTR. They just do in the live environment, yeah. which is nuts. Absolutely nuts. Uh, World of Warcraft does a PTR. And so like, I'm trying to understand where New World is and where we would hope future games would be. Where do yeah. you hope Ashes falls? Where do you hope these games fall? And, and do any games need to move where they are right now? There is an argument for World of Warcraft pulling back from the amount of things they put on the PTR. There's an argument for, for Final Fantasy XIV. Um, there have been people who are very frustrated with how limited the access to things like the Media Tour are, that there aren't more things other than basically the... Um, the benchmark that gets shared in advance. There's very few things. Should they, should they do that? Mm -hmm. um, so where does, what all does new world put on a PTR compared to what drops on patch day? Uh, pretty much outside of anything that's labeled. Like this is a specific PTR test. We're testing out this idea. Um, if it's, if it's labeled as that, and then pretty much the PTR becomes the, the live environment. Uh, and we've seen that happen a few times where they're like, listen, we're going to test out something like this is not meant right now for live. Uh, this is kind of a little special. So they'll highlight that in patch notes themselves. Um, and that's pretty much what it is. So we are right now testing basically the October build. Uh, and what they've been doing on the PTR is actually interesting is they, they've been rolling out in stages. So they really wanted players to test the new player experience and not get distracted by brimstone. So we didn't uh, for the first two weeks, it was all. PTR, new player experience, great sword. Go nuts. Go have fun with that. That's what we want feedback on first. And sure. then essentially just this last Thursday, Brimstone rolls out. Great. Let's get some feedback on that. And what they're actually discovering is really interesting. It's actually a point of frustration. And it was a part of the feedback that not only I provided, but many others. I made a video on this specifically because what happened was is that you have these quests that turn into these rapid bottlenecks because enemies weren't spawning fast enough or they were dying super fast because there's just this horde of players rolling through that boss is going to die in one second you got to get a hit on them or you're going to have to wait until the next time that boss spawns which will be a few minutes from now at a minimum oh like it's not it's just generally not fun and so at least the feedback that i gave was like detect how many people are on the quest detect how many people are in that area and increase their spawn rate and or hp because at the end of the day, like people want to get that hit in, they want to continue on, but it doesn't feel good when boss spawns, boss dead, you continue to wait and more people are still filling in. It's not like that queue is, oh, okay. Yeah. I've, I've, I finally got it after two or three spawns. No, it's, you're still like, oh, now the next wave of players who are behind me at the last gate, you know, came into it. Now, the nice thing is they, Amazon's already responded. They're like, Hey, next update for the PTR this should be fixed. So actually, I actually have been holding off on testing because it actually just wasn't one quest. It felt like it was one quest. You do some other things and then you hit another wall. You do some other things and you hit another wall. So ideally, this is something like they're like, oh my gosh, yes. That was something we didn't anticipate. Now, it's also not a problem when it's five people. Like, when, like if it's just five people running through, like you'll never find that information out. You would never see what, what they actually saw with the rush. And you know, and then after here in, 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 in a year when Brimstone isn't the new new and people are playing through the, 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 the zone storyline, et cetera. Like, yeah, they probably won't run into that problem at all ever. But, you know, like this is where it's like they need to definitely like pay attention to this. And we've seen other games actually address this by having multiple pathways so that it's like, OK, yeah, clearly we're not sending in, you know, 300 people or, you know, the servers, you know, continue to increase their capacity you know, a thousand people into this, like, okay, let's, you know, let's try to separate spread them. people out yeah. in Endwalker at the beginning, they yeah. spread people out and world of Warcraft has gone back and forth on this because you cannot tell a cohesive linear story. If you let people do chapters out of order. Mm -hmm. However, if you don't let people do things out of order, a, there's no agency, none. You are just along for the ride on a tram on your left. You'll see this like, that's yeah. it. You're just, you're just getting dragged through the content and B on launch day. You are, you are just continually funneling people. You know, they slide off the path, get back on the path, get back on the path. And you're just keeping them. Don't walk on the grass. And it tends to make the path 
crowded, mm -hmm. um, which is just asking for problems. And if there is a problem and it only affects a fringe group, uh, or if there is a problem that is based on load, you're guaranteeing that that problem will be found um, because you're, you're saying, hey, we tested it with 200 testers six times mm -hmm. with a simulated thousand people on the server. Great. Now let's do it with 20 million people on the server. Uh, and let's do it a couple of million times and let's see if we can find a problem that our testers didn't find in the two weeks they had to test. It's like, well, of course you're going to find things like, like just the, the scale of what's being tested is crazy. Um, so the PTR is, is a really interesting thing. The fact that they're funneling like that, that's how Guild Wars does things. Uh, when I say they do it in the live environment, um, imagine if World of Warcraft players evoker, uh, imagine if for Final Fantasy players, Sage and Reaper, um, mm -hmm. and so just imagine if for a moment, um, prior to the expansion going live that, that, that was in, you got a given period, maybe uh, a week long lockout or something like that, that when you logged in, you just had a separate character that was your brimstone character in this case, and you logged into it and anything you got on it, you didn't get to keep, but that character was basically a beta character, but it's on live servers. So if you hop into a PvP match, you're in there with people's mains. Mm -hmm. So they whether you run a dungeon, oh, we got an evoker as our healer. That's your real healer. Um, now that character will be uh, deleted at the end of the week. And I, I think there's some weird stuff with like, well, how does it work with like account wide locks? And I think you could like mail things off. So like there's some logistics that has to be sorted out on the back end, but effectively you're saying, I don't want feedback just from PTR players because one right. of the downsides I see in a PTR is that you're not getting authentic data. Mm -hmm. You're getting people who behave really weirdly. You get people who don't care about their money. They don't care about their progress because it's not going to be kept anyway. You get only the most hardcore people are, are hopping on there in the first place. So you get very little casual feedback, kind of like making an adjustment to like a savage fight after only one week of it being out. You're only really getting feedback from people who made it to that savage fight that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so any log data you get is heavily skewed towards very talented, invested players. Um, just as a hypothetical thing that might happen. Uh, and so like, <laughs> no, no real world. P like PTRs scenario. are hard. Um, so like, how do you, you know, and, and there is an argument of like, what do you just want me to do your QA team's job? No, it's, it's different. The, the people, the PTR has feedback. And so the QA team is now reading feedback instead of testing themselves. It's the same labor. But instead, I can read feedback from thousands of players, or I can test only what I see. Yeah. So it's all QA. A PTR is QA, not having a PTR is QA. Every company gets by with as little QA as they can pay for and get the quality that they expect. Nobody's over QAing. They're QAing to exactly the threshold. If they do a lot of QA, that's because they think it's mandatory. If they didn't think it was mandatory, they would cut that cost because it's just expense. It's really hard to realize in the moment how much you spend on QA versus problems. Um, if you could get the same testing results in less time, that would be better. Uh, so like that's, that's where we're at. Um, I have friends who've worked in QA and, and like understand the time crunches they're under and devs don't want to go pencils down. They're like, no, the patch doesn't release to the state, but they have to turn it over. So like that QA time, it's not just like, oh, we don't want to have QA staff. It's also that like QA staff are actively competing with development time. Because mm -hmm. if you're going to test the final product, that means it has to be final. Uh, which means that like devs at that point are only bug fixing. That's all they're allowed to do. Yeah. So it gets really hard. I have friends that work for big hardware companies and they talk about, you know, companies like, but not limited to like Nvidia or Apple as an example. How does that work? When do you go pencils down? Um, and that's a weird time for devs. So how does new world handle that? Well, right now, like you said, like it's with the rollout, they're focusing on bug fixing they're focusing on kind of like like feature tweaking it's not that they're going to get sit here and all of a sudden add a new system unless it's already part of the plan and they're in their kind of rollout like as we've seen loadouts in in the data mine for the ptr but not yet actually being tested meaning when we start to look at when we actually saw the zone for brimstone in the ptr that was in july we weren't able to access it but we could actually see it on the map meaning like yeah these things are getting staged in as a part of like rollouts but they're not flag to be on and so when it comes down to it it's like this is bug fixing balancing uh you know looking at feedback and and kind of prioritizing like is this feedback that's going to prevent like that's going to cause issues when the game goes live when this goes live and 
October? Or is this feedback that's like, oh yeah, we definitely need to address that. Let's put that, make sure that's, you know, the devs who are working on what's coming next are, are hey, look into this and let's make sure we have this ready to go. And so that's essentially what's, what, what's ultimately happening right now. Like, the, honestly, I can tell you from playing on the PTR, like you feel a difference than you actually do on live. Like the code of the game feels more solid. It feels like it's like, oh man, the game feels way more optimized. Like it feels like within all of these things that there's many teams and this is kind of the effort of multiple different kind of things. And even if it's not a patch note, like anybody who's playing on the PTR, like when you go play on live, like live feels really good right now, but the PTR feels even better. And you're not even, you could be just running around any of the zones they haven't touched. You're like, all right, this definitely feels way more optimized, way more, way, way better performance, et cetera. So now this is bug fixing. Um, as we look at the rest of this month and then in October, like my, my biggest fear right now is that October the 18th is both new world and 14, you know, dungeons, like the criterion dungeons, like that in and of itself will mean like a wild day where it's like, Ooh, you know, why, why both of you? Like my, my dream MMO content creator mind says, not at the same time, guys. <laughs> like, just like not at the same time. Like, y'all look at each other's schedules and say, you know what? We'll go the next week. Uh, that would be wonderful. But right now, it's it might be seeming that, you know, October the 18th is, ends up being a pretty busy day, which gives them roughly another, you know, month of, you know, fixing and testing and making sure that when it does drop, that people who are coming back for the first time, whether it's fresh start, have a smooth experience. What you don't need when, if you're New World devs right now is people coming back and it's like, and the game doesn't run, you know, like we don't, because that in and of itself will like deflate the, the, uh, the hard work and the long hours that they've been putting in. Um, and then, um, you know, like, and I don't know if Cole's talking about 14, but they have a new Halloween event that's on the PTR right now that we're testing. And that boss is legit freaky and hard as hell. Like, it's like, it's interesting. I'd love to know your thoughts. Cause like, as we kind of pivot and unfortunately I do have a, hard stop at noon so this might we might save our what it was going to be our third topic for for wednesday's uh kicking off wednesday's live show so guys think about what crossovers you want to see in 14. um so within the within the uh within the halloween event like yeah you can go run uh the the mobs that you start farming around level 30 so it's like okay that feels like a decent level for a halloween event the summer event was level 20. So in 14, it seems around level 15. That's kind of where the, you know, the seasonal events say that's when, that's when we want you into these. And in 14, they're straight up like, yeah, go do this, go do this. Here's your achievement. Here's your, whatever the reward is. Thank you for playing in this one. It's like you go and you're killing these pumpkins. And then all of a sudden this level 66 bo boss spawns in and will destroy you. Like, it's not like, oh, I see that you are a solo player it's it, oh let me adjust to you no it's like you oh you weren't ready for this and there was something so beautifully exciting about that experience because i was in there i was playing with uh mike aka uh, sir rule here and we were sitting here and all of a sudden it's like and and all it is is laughing and screaming oh god he's he's focusing on me oh god and then you're like watching his life barely tick down and you're like all right okay <laughs> This is crazy because it's a quest step and it, it's to beat this guy right now. It's a quest step. And I was just like, yeah, we got yeeted and freaking deleted multiple times. And we even started teaming up with other people running into the area. And it was just, it was just chaos. So it's like, all right, like that's, this is going to be something that's different because it's not like the other events that I've seen in other games. Like this feels like it's like built for level 60 players, which is unique and curious is to see the long-term effects of that because imagine wanting to get into the halloween event and then being like well no <laughs> sorry better luck next time next year so you're talking about staged things you're talking about upcoming events you're talking about communication from the devs yeah so the final portion of this topic is how things get rolled out and what happens when you roll something out to the servers because you need that internally but it's yeah. meant to be staged it's designed to be staged and so you aren't ready for it to be public or what happens if something gets leaked otherwise um through somebody breaking an embargo or an employee mm -hmm. or whatever yeah. um we're seeing grand theft auto it's grand theft auto 6 footage has been leaked the grand theft auto uh, 5 and 6 source code in theory is out there being circulated and being ransomed and there is a portion of the people voicing their opinions on this that feel like because Grand Theft Auto has been around for like 10 years and they haven't said anything about Grand Theft Auto 6 that they somehow deserve 
to have their material leaked and then ransomed. Right. Um, that that, mm. that they've earned that. Um, and so like, Sounds like an entitled with 14, gamer. we see leaks. Yeah. As well, we see leaks, even with PTRs, right? There's there's rumors now of, of kind of some bigger stuff on the horizon for WoW. Um, how do kind of leaks affect um how do fe- how do how do they how do how does that affect new world um how's new world in getting in front of or behind yeah. leaks and getting information out at a pace that will satiate gamers what's interesting here is that i don't actually think we've seen real leaks because the devs have communicated and signaled these things before they quote unquote leak what the leak ends up doing is it kind of in a way is building in a level of trust that is going to have to establish itself with time devs confirmed like in february loadouts are on the way oh now we're starting to see the code in the in the ptr so for anybody who's not been paying attention i get to go out and say loadouts are on the way you don't have to just trust the words of a dev from february here's here's the evidence of that here's the information in the ptr um same thing with even like the 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 events even with the fresh start servers the devs actually already communicated these things already but not like in so much detail. So we're it just basically in this case starts to just kind of build off of what they've already said. Devs confirmed they were working on mounts like back in November. And now we're and now we start to see them kind of being a little bit more open and loose with that. So in my mind, we actually really haven't seen anything leak. In fact, they they brought in musical instruments in July and it completely shocked everybody. That was something that they didn't say was coming and then we didn't see it on the PTR. So honestly, I'm really kind of the impression is that these aren't really what I would call leaks or data mines within New World. These are planned specifically already building off of things that they've said. So as you start to read like what they post on the forums and you know on social media, yeah, like you, not everybody's get getting that information, so it feels like a leak. It's as exciting as we got special information, but what it is is actually confirming something they said a while ago. Um, and yet, any and I haven't seen anything drop. The only thing I guess would be the exception would be the mutator dungeons. They said, you know, hey, we're going to work on some, you know, something with the dungeon. They didn't really go into it, and then we see in the data mines back in the day, oh, dungeons level up, and they have all these different things. And you know, it was like, oh, that was that was the last thing I could ultimately remember. But everything else that seems like they've communicated in a way, like it maybe could be kind of cryptic. It's not like full fledged details and we actually get more details on it, but it isn't something like GTA six where it's like, yeah, everybody knows it's being worked on, but we actually see gameplay footage and the people feel owed the information for making them wait so long, which in my mind, that's just gamer entitlement. My favorite was the ones who say we already paid them. You didn't pay them for six. You paid for five. Pay for five. So like, because you bought a game 10 years ago, your owed information on the next game. Right. And they're like, way to care for your fan base. I mean, GTA six doesn't have a fan base. Like, yes, I'm sure it plans on hopefully converting a lot of GTA five players, but that's not an obligation. That's going to be a challenge if they don't have an online version. You are not obligated to play GTA six and they're not obligated to build a game that appeals specifically to GTA five players. If they feel that they want to take the game in any direction, they can like that's their product if they don't yeah. want to talk about it that's their right just because if you were running the product team you, you would talk different. about it that's it's their call i, I think uh, if they were running the product team they wouldn't because they start to understand the importance of the message and and, and controlling the excitement and hype now that kind of thread in gta's case is actually they've lost that they've lost the ability to deliver that like where you go P, in and one of the things we get back to the devs there is our ability to be excited and to share that excitement and that announcement uh, you know, Mail Vieira, right? Like we got to see like a lot of people who are excited for that, get the thing that they've been wanting, you know, for uh, two years. And then that was like, you know, imagine having that already out and that ends up being uh, huge. And then you can end up having this shared moment of excitement and a gift back to the devs for their hard work. And so I think essentially that kind of is a, is a key aspect. And so when people are like, hey, watch I, those clips. Yeah. yeah, it's a gift. It's a gift. Um, and so when all that stuff gets ruined, that's why it's like if 14 added a PTR, I think there'd be way more things that, you know, could get ruined. And so I'm kind of glad 14 doesn't do it in new world's case. I'm kind of glad they do, but then it ultimately gets to a, to a system of, is there a point where you trust them enough that, that we're good, that they've learned the lessons enough and, and who knows, like that, that could be something that 
here in five, 10 years, New World still has the PTR and we're still excited for its future. Or it ends up being like, yeah, like I really don't, you know, I, I'm just going to wait till whatever drops on live, drops on live. The majority of player bases wait for the live stuff. I think you end up having kind of those who are really excited, cutting edge or content creators. Because one of the things that like I do feel the pressure, especially at having a dedicated New World channel, like, yeah, I want to go check out the PTR because I want to disseminate the information and, and make it value, you know, value driven for for the people who like and watch my videos, you know, it's like, there's like being on the front lines kind of has that impact. And so I'm trying to be cognizant of these two forces at play, like spoilers versus not as somebody who's not spoiler sensitive. It, it I, I know I'm not impacted, but I know that especially coming from final fantasy 14, like spoilers are a, a huge thing. You know, it's, you know, you gotta be very careful and what some people define, even still today, what some people define as a spoiler in 14, like, I'm like, I don't see it. <laughs> like I, I don't I do not see how you make that connection to this as a spoiler. The only reason why you're saying that is that you know what happens. It's not spoiling it for you, so therefore you think it's a spoiler for other things. Like watching certain, you know, fights doesn't spoil it for me, but I have my own, you know, weird code, you know, in that regards. There are times that it does, right? There are times where a boss talks or things like that and like makes big reveals in a fight. And that's very different, right? And there's there's fights where like you go, wait, why are we fighting them? And so like that element of it's kind of mm -hmm. kind of taken away. But like, um, especially when we look at things like like P5S, P5S, or P, watching the, the world first race or watching P5 normal, like mm -hmm. it, that fight has no context. Um, so if they would, if they really wanted to go true spoiler free for people's streams, they would let me um, have a setting like abbreviate bosses' names. If I've already seen the boss, if I've already cleared the fight, abbreviate boss's names because that's it. Like it's, it's just the names abbreviate the duty. Like if they would just do that, like I, I feel that I could stream P five through eight without names and have the text. Not, and if they wouldn't have the text appear over the screen of any time the boss talks and they're just bosses, mm -hmm. um, they're just bosses with abilities. That means nothing. You don't know what you don't know. Um, however, like today when I'm streaming heaven's word MSQ, yeah, that's going to have some spoilers on it. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah. So, absolutely. Now, uh, cool. as, as we wrap up this uh, this last video and a section of the live show itself, before I get ready to jump into my my you know my next thing, uh, you know, Cole Smith asks, has New World announced for start servers uh, would actually launch? I'd consider it, but I want uh, all the new leveling changes in place, etc. So, no official date for fresh start, but I'm guessing they're going to pair it with the October release because then you get all of the new starting experience. It would be weird to do a fresh start and then in two weeks, then Changes. launch it. So now as to the date where it's looking like it's October, my guess would be sometime mid October um, would be the most uh, like, I guess, reasonable and rational kind of time frame. Um, they are running an event and we do know uh, not, we don't know the start, but we know that it's planning on ending on uh, November the 18th. They're going to be uh, having kind of this big Twitch drop and probably sale and, all of these things going on. So when we talk about them turning on marketing and the excitement and the hype, um, it's going to be like, so the only th the thing is that if you're going to start with fresh start, like that's brand new character, no transfers, etc. You're kind of starting into this fresh world as a fresh character and there's going to be streamers. And I don't know how many fresh start servers there will be, but that's something you want to probably take into account because if you're expecting, you know, this kind of like really nice casual experience note, they'll probably be big streamers playing maybe on one of these worlds because that's where they're, they're going to be partnering up with some of these big big guys and that's going to that could cause you know that could ruin a fresh start experience depending on that i'll be sure to break all of the information down as we learn it from the official sources over on gender world for you guys uh for those of you who are interested now if you're asking should you return and you want to play on your character yes the answer is yes and now is the time and it's got a player driven economy so gold has a lot of value and you could be making tons of gold right now which will eventually benefit you down the road uh, you know, I like to go and I, I end up making anywhere from like 40 to 50 G's a week if I'm actually like caring about it. And then I'll go buy a couple of legendaries or something like that because you can buy best in slot with gold, which is great. I like it. Uh, <laughs> it speaks to me. Um, so that's uh, that's going to be that. So uh, I'll be keeping you guys up to date as the details uh, emerge further. Uh, Chris, uh, you got any final thoughts before we wrap up uh, today's uh, live show? No, this was fun. Hopefully you guys are enjoying these. We're to, or even do these Monday, Wednesday, Friday as um, I don't have any final thoughts on this, but my final announcement to end on um, is that I will be out uh, Friday, the uh, September 23rd through the end of September. Um, and so that is that is going to be my time off. 
Uh, Brian may be streaming during that with his typical schedule, mm -hmm. uh, but the typical stream hours Monday through Friday will go dark and I will see you guys in October. Yeah, I probably will end up taking uh, over some of those. Uh, I, I don't have any official announcements to make yet, um, but as we both said, as we're relying more on content creation, as we figure it, you know, like at least in my case, as I kind of figure it out, uh, what's my next, uh, what's my next adventure in terms of work? Um, we'll let you guys uh, know in that regards. If you want to continue the show, I put the link to Twitch over in chat. Uh, Chris is going to be continuing on over there. We appreciate any and all lurk support over there as well. It helps us out so much uh, as well. But with that, we're going to wrap up. Thanks so much for listening, watching. If you're part of the MP3 and you feel like this earns it, give it a rating. It's a great way to help the podcast uh, grow over on podcasting platforms pretty much everywhere. Anyway, guys, thanks for being here. We'll see you on Wednesday. But until then, take care.